Hi everyone, your host, Neely here, and I just wanted to let you know that I actually created this episode back in March, before the George Floyd protests broke out, so in that respect, it might be a little bit outdated, but I still think that a lot of the topics I touch on and things we talked about still hold true today. If you'd like to see a future episode talking about the George Floyd protests and adding that as a layer to this episode's topic, please let me know, um, shoot me a Facebook message or Instagram a message or leave a comment on one of our posts. As always, thanks for listening to Model Minority Uniquely American. And without further ado, here's episode four, The Racial Wedge. I believe that we are at the point now in the United States where a movement is beginning to emerge. I think that the calamity the quagmire of the Iraq war, the outsourcing of jobs, the dropout of young people from the educational system, the monstrous growth of the prison industrial complex, the planetary emergency in which we are engulfed at the present moment, is re- demanding that instead of just complaining about these things, we begin to look for and hope for another way of living. And I think that that's when the movement, I I see a movement beginning to emerge because I see hope beginning to trump despair. Race. It's something that nearly every current event and political issue is concerned with. The matter in which we learn about race is imperfect at best and dangerous at its worst. Racial minorities have been written in a certain way, historically largely by people outside of their spheres. The model minority myth plays a huge role in pitting races against each other, and for this episode, I set out to get a deeper understanding of one of the biggest and most insidious fallacies of the model minority myth. The fact that it is used as a racial wedge between Asians and Blacks in America. So. Get ready to learn, unlearn, and relearn as we explore why the racial wedge is not only problematic, but also illegitimate. I'm Nidhi Shastri, and this is Model Minority, Uniquely American. Hi, everyone. I actually wanted to start by paying homage to the root of where I got the inspiration to make this podcast, a 2017 article from NPR's Code Switch. The article, written by Kat Chow, begins centered around a piece that was published in the New York Magazine, which fueled the model minority myth using verbiage, again, out of the original article we examined in episode one. Yep, that again, except this time in 2017. I feel like they seriously come out with a new version of the article every year just to really drive home the point they're trying to make about how picturesque Asians are. Except the racial wedge is where it all gets kind of dangerous. When the model minority myth was created, it was often used, as we examined with Dr. Park, as a nod to the Horatio Alger story. It stated that Asians' hard work and strong family values led to their immeasurable economic success. And what it thus implied, to put it starkly, was that other minorities were just not working hard enough. More particularly, Black Americans. This has not only created an entire social system of how we perceive both Blacks and Asians in America, but it has also fueled interracial tensions between the two groups for years. And more recently, it's been used to pit Asians against Latinos as well. And it's a shame, because as Grace Lee Boggs, an Asian American activist who we heard from in the intro, worked to point out, we have far more in common than we realize. However, Asians aren't the only one pit against Blacks and Latinos due to the model minority myth. A lesser known victim? African immigrants. This is due to a perception of hierarchy within the Black community that has been created by the same normative majority that created the model minority myth, 
It feeds on the idea that African immigrants in the States are the quote-unquote better blacks and are harder working and hold stronger values than their African American counterparts. And as you can imagine, there are a lot of flaws with this way of thinking, including the fact that both groups are in fact black. But it's so instilled within American society that even Africans overseas are aware of it. My name is Matala Nyugosaya, but I also go by Mo, and my brand name is Mustabo, and um, I am originally from Nigeria, was born and bred there. I moved to the U.S. about 10 years ago, and my ethnic city will be black, but um, as far as my tribe within the Nigerian um, community, I'm what you call Yoruba, which is one of the major tribes in Nigeria. So one thing I observed was let me give you a little bit of a backstory. So growing up in Nigeria, we had a lot of, um, I would say for me personally, and I think to an extent it might be true for a lot of people you meet, our opinions about blacks in the U.S. weren't quite positive ones, you know, because a lot of what we watched was on TV and usually the blacks were, black people were being, you know, portrayed as, you know, the gangsters or the serial killers and the murderers, things like that, they weren't quite positive. So we had this mentality, well, I had this bias about, you know, black people like, oh, you know, they could be violent and things like that. So moving to the U.S. on an academic visa, so imagine that you only get to mix with a sort of people. You don't really get to go into the community to get to know how people live in the real world. So school was a bubble. And so for um, for those that are coming to the U.S. on a student visa, I think it's something that we can consider like a privilege. That's a friend of mine and a fellow podcaster, Mo Sybil. You can check out her work by looking up her podcast, The More Sybil Podcast. And what she explains here is the idea of the way African Americans have been socialized, not just here in the United States, but to the whole world. Returning to the 2017 article from NPR, it refers to a term called racial resentment. In the article, it states how the term refers to a quote-unquote moral feeling that blacks violate such traditional American values as individualism and self-reliance, as defined by political scientists Donald Kinder and David Sears. So basically, to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and achieve the American dream, Horatio Alger mentality, yup, the one we heard about before. But as we examined within the context of economically struggling Asians and Africans, this is a problematic ideology. It's an unfair and selective representation of all of us. All the while, it ignores hundreds of years of racial struggles of African Americans and struggles that continue in new forms such as police brutality, environmental injustice, and school-to-prison pipeline, even today. And my friend Mo expressed a similar sentiment. So yes, um, I, I I think that's the, the privilege we have as Nigerians, as Blacks, uh, especially those that left Africa to come to the U.S. Um, on a student visa, is that the, the Black community as a whole, they haven't quite experienced that, you know, gain. You know, if you see, look at the trajectory. And so when they talk about Blacks, you know, making a lot of gains in the U.S., you find that if you were to look at the within group differences, you see that it's a lot of immigrant Blacks. And I feel like as Africans coming here, we can't take that for granted because God forbid if a couple to stop you, he's not going to ask, oh, you're from Africa right now. You're just going to be black. Exactly. If you're stopped by cops, you're not going to be seen as XYZ identity. You're going to be seen as black regardless. As Dr. Barra said in a past episode, the black experience becomes a common experience. However, the politicization of African immigrants, similar to Asian immigrants and refugees, becomes dependent on context. And because of that, it's easy to get stuck in the wrong side of the stereotype. The fact of the matter is, there is no room for nuance to this myth. Rather, there is a framework set up by it that forces racial minorities into their respective quote-unquote place. This myth has been in part intentionally created to compare and devalue African Americans in whatever way possible, and Asians were a convenient and strategic pawn in doing so.
myself out in this black mirror Look at my outfit, isn't it a killer? They say if a pine tree was to go Timber and the Those who don't know me, my name is Jason Chu I'm a Chinese American rapper and poet I live in Los Angeles And um, when we're not under, you know, a global lockdown uh, I'm a recording artist I do a lot of touring, I do a lot of college shows And I have a group called Night Market uh, that's a Chinese American trap crew, and uh, yeah, I just love making music and getting out there in front of people to share that music. Literally, there's 150 years of Asian American arts and Asian American um, social engagement that we can draw from. But I think one issue is that honestly, often people are lazy, uh, which is not to say okay. So this is the issue, right? Um, white supremacy operates on Asian American bodies and voices to erase us. So already we're actively erased, right? The Japanese American incarceration is barely mentioned. Uh, Chinese American railroad workers are barely mentioned. The Philippines, the annexation of the Philippines, it's never even mentioned. The Spanish American War is mentioned, but what we did with the Pacific Islands after that war is never mentioned, even though it devastated the Philippines culturally. Um, so white supremacy already erases our stories. The flip side of that is, so, so it's easy for Asian Americans to think, oh, we're the first. But the truth is, if we do, we got to do this digging. We got to preserve our histories because, again, white people aren't going to do this for us. Mainstream America is not going to preserve this, right? Mainstream America wants us to think that our history starts 10 years ago when Eddie publishes Fresh Off the Boat. Uh, mainstream America wants to tell us that eight years ago when Jay Lynn had Linsanity, that was the first time America had ever loved an Asian American athlete. But that's not true. We have Christiane Maguchi, we have Michelle Kwan, we have Michael Chang, we have, you know, um, all of these figures in our history that to me it's not, do you have an Asian American hero or do you have an Asian American role model? It's, why don't we? That's the question we've got to ask. Why is it that you can name 50 white and black athletes before you can name, you know, two Asian American ones? Okay, so we have to somehow reconstruct the system. But how do we even start to conceptualize and work to unravel this deeply ingrained myth? Well, today we're going to start by disproving the legitimacy of the racial wedge itself. Then we're going to take a look into the records of African American and Asian history in the U.S. and see what we can learn from it. Now, you don't have to look hard to find out how the legitimacy of the racial wedge is completely false. In fact, if you think back to the stuff we touched on so far in the series, for example, how Asians are the most impoverished group in NY City, how different racism affects different Asians, and how Asian history has been erased to make us invisible, you see multiple facets of Asians that disproves the main basis of the idea that all Asians are able to pull themselves up from rags to riches and live in an idealistic, happy life. Along with this, the racial wedge hinges on another erasure, that of the struggle of black Americans. If you're black in America, um, you carry that, that legacy of racial hurt and trauma. And so as Asian Americans, we have to be very aware of that, right? And, and there's a lot of, like you said, there's a lot of tension between our communities because of the way that often Asian Americans are placed physically as a buffer between white suburbs or white zones, white schools, white areas, and, and, and black neighborhoods. But, um, you know, the way for us to move forward isn't, and, and I think that in this quarantine era, in this era of racist, racist panic around the coronavirus, um, we've seen very much so that Asian American adjacency to whiteness is a complete fabrication. While researching, I came across a piece that was published by the American Educational Research Association in 2007 titled Contesting the Model Minority and the Perpetual Foreigner Stereotypes, a critical review of literature on Asian Americans in education. 
I was ecstatic to see that somebody was researching and writing about this stuff, although it shouldn't surprise me, even in 2007. And funny enough, I noticed that the piece came from a study done at the University of Illinois, my very own alma mater. But it gets better. The piece was written in part by none other than our very own Dr. Yoon Pak. The work focuses on literature on Asians and Asian Americans in education and states that the continued emphasis on educational research that presumes and highlights the academic achievements of Asian Americans creates a wedge between other minority groups. Coupled with this, Asian American success discourse is a presumption of African American and Latino academic underachievement. It goes on to explain how this presumption works to maintain white privilege and white people's place in normative American culture. It refers to a publication that showed historically how there is ample evidence of a persistence of educational attainment that the African American community has had since the time of slavery and beyond. And to say that the whole black American demographic doesn't care about or value education is ridiculous. Couple that with the idea that all Asians value it and pursue it by the erasure of disparities within different Asian groups. And there you have it, a form of the racial wedge unfolding right before our own eyes. All right, enough from me. Let's hear from one of the authors herself, Dr. Pak. She discussed with me a little bit more about the way Asians are wedged between the black and white binary. You know, I've taught a course on Asian American education for almost 20 years. And when we talk about this, I always ask it in relation to everyone else. So, for example, when uh, students talk about, well, you know, there's the Asian family values, right, that uh, value education. So then I turn it back on them and say, well, so what are you trying to say, that other groups don't value families? and education. And so that's where I spend uh, a few weeks kind of going over the history of American education and where from the very beginning you have African American parents, right, from uh, post-slavery working at every uh, angle and within every means to ensure, right, that their kids get equal uh, access to schooling, get that um, top value education, but not just African Americans, but um, Latinx, American Indian. So it span, it runs the gamut of all people of color groups in the United States. And so I use those historical examples to state, if we think about educational access, uh, equal right to education, it's every group and parents, right, fighting um, for their own kids' agency. It's just that we haven't learned about it enough and don't understand. Um, it's not just a, a gene that Asians have, right? It's, not a, it's nothing biological, right? And it's nothing cultural. Her research also goes deeper into examining how we view race in America. You have to remember that race is a socially constructed concept, even though that feels kind of like we're breaking the fourth wall. In the publication, it states, Asian American racialization, as both the model minority and the foreigner, exists within a larger racial discourse. Asian Americans have been racialized relative to whites and blacks. But racialization is more complex than a hierarchy with whites on top and blacks on bottom and other groups in between. Asian Americans are racially triangulated vis-a-vis -vis whites and blacks through two interrelated processes of relative valorization, meaning whites valorizing Asian Americans relative to blacks, and the process of civic ostracism, where whites construct Asian Americans as foreign and other. Kind of complicated, right? Okay, however, this is a concept that is crucial to understanding why the racial wedge exists. It relies on the black and white binary that points to the black experience as a monolithic one and the white experience as diverse and normative, while additionally creating a system of hierarchy. It doesn't make sense to see race as a pyramid-leveled hierarchy in America. One of the reasons for this is quite simply that not all Asians are the same race. Okay, sounds weird, right? Now, of course, in terms of governmental racial categories and continent of origin, yes, we're all considered Asian. But what I mean by this is that my South Asian hair and brown skin is hardly what I personally constitute to be the same race as East Asians. 
To deem this difference as a difference in race is a subjective stance, and I recognize that. But I think to some extent, you have to acknowledge the large characteristic differences between South Asians and East Asians. And it's one that's been reflected in history. Starting with how South Asians were deemed in 1911 to be the quote-unquote least desirable race of immigrants by the U.S. government, all the way to post-9-11 racism and backlash. South Asians have had experiences that are different than East Asians and are often reflective of their skin color and characteristics. We were deemed as quote-unquote jungle Asians, and unfortunately, it's a term that's still used today. So my point here is to say that, frankly, having a pyramid hierarchy to conceptualize race in America is reductive and limiting to all racial minorities because it poses the same problem as the Asian racial category does. It groups a multitude of voices into one common monolithic experience and then essentially works to rank us all. Um, yikes. Now, in order to knock the racial wedge ideology off of its legs, we need to also consider this pyramidal hierarchy in relation to another underrecognized group, African immigrants. According to a 2018 study titled Parsing the Gulf Between Africans and African Americans conducted by McDaniel College, the data they collected confirmed previous reports that African Americans lack a sense of connection to Africans, attributed to Africans' alleged sense of superiority and disregard for African Americans' ongoing struggle to end oppression. The article states, this primary lens in which race and racism are central appear to be less salient among black immigrants. Fewer of them are socialized to be wary of an oppressive ruling class of a different race, and they often arrive in the U.S. with greater capital to concentrate on upward mobility, contributing to their representation and reputation as the model minority. African status as model minorities bestows upon them an elevated minority status that diverges from contrasting views of African Americans such as those based on unflattering stereotypes about inferior academic prowess and motivation. So basically, what it's saying is that the perception of African immigrants as model minority goes back to the way they were politicized against African Americans. And that perspective has permeated into the black community, leading African Americans to have a perspective of African immigrants as privileged, hyper-focused on school, and lacking empathy or motivation surrounding racial struggles. Sound familiar? Well... That's because these are the same things linked to Asians as well. When we're talking about the racial wedge, basically what it does is both erase a history of struggle with Asians and African stories and completely ignore centuries of dehumanization towards Black Americans. And the history of African Americans is not only a unique minority experience, but the community has also paved the way for civil rights and racial equality for all racial minorities in the country, and I'd argue for non-racial minorities as well. So now we have more context to the divide between African Americans and Asian and African model minorities in the U.S. But what I also wanted to know was, in what ways have we historically defied this myth and instead stood in solidarity? And what can we learn from it? Because while there's a lot of solidarity between Blacks and Asians, often there's a lot of tensions too. Crash Course Asian History Time Let's start back in 1790 with the Nationality Act. This act basically stated that, quote unquote, any alien being a free white person who had been in the U.S. for two years or more was eligible for naturalization. Any person of color, you guessed it, ineligible. This was one of many, many acts made by the U.S. government to limit and deny permanence of people of color in the United States and largely targeted Asian immigrants and Asian indentured laborers. Now, 
very few of these laborers came to the states by choice. Many from China came out of what we in Hindi call majburi, or great need, along with tactics like negotiation through kidnapping, decoy, and fraud. Others from Hindustan, or the South Asian British Raj at the time, came from the largely overwritten South Asian slave trade, which was a system of kidnapping Indian families, women, and children, and selling them to create colonies in the African and North American world. Though record of this is harder to find, one place it has been recorded is in a book by Indrani Chatterjee from 2006 titled Slavery in South Asian History. These laborers were labeled coolies, a word that derives from the Hindi and Tamil word kuli, which means wages, and it's now widely known to be a racial slur. The Naturalization Act of 1790 was one of the first binding factors between the African-American, Asian, and African immigrant community. All of us were facing oppression and barred from citizenship status under this law. By the mid-1800s, East Asians were more prevalent in the states, and they marked white on the U.S. Census in an attempt to assimilate, a similarity to what we examined with Middle Eastern and North African immigrants today. However, in 1854, a case raised to the California Supreme Court ruled that the testimony of a Chinese man who witnessed the murder of another Chinese man by a white man was inadmissible, denying Chinese alongside Native and African Americans the status to testify in courts against whites. This case is known as People versus Hall. And it essentially explicitly classified Asians as people of color, stating that the Chinese are, quote unquote, a race of people whom nature has marked as inferior and who are incapable of progress or intellectual development beyond a certain point, and as such had no right to swear away the life of a citizen or participate in governmental affairs. Following this, the late 1800s were marked by a slew of laws and racism that barred out Asians from entering the U.S., such as the Chinese Exclusion Act and the Jerry Act. Out of this rose solidarity between African Americans and East Asians. The lynching and yellow face against East Asians in the U.S. led to coalitions in the late 1800s and 1900s, forming slogans such as Yellow Peril for Black Lives to combat policing and brutality in the Black and African community and a coming together over a common struggle. East Asian activists, such as Grace Lee Boggs, helped blaze the way for solidarity between the two groups, and for that matter, for the entire Asian community. Though arguably lesser known, South Asians also found a footing in solidarity with African American communities, and vice versa. While there were fewer South Asian immigrants in the 1900s, those who were in the states faced hardship and racism. A page called Black Desi Secret History. Okay, it's one hell of a name, but it's legit. I investigated it. Documents the solidarity between the two communities that goes beyond just MLK and Gandhi. On a frigid, snowy day in September of 1942, over 80 black intellectuals sent President Roosevelt a joint letter encouraging him to take divisive action to resolve the crisis of colonialization and dehumanization in India. That same day, a white sociologist named Horace Caton told readers of The Nation magazine, quote unquote, It may seem odd to hear India discussed in pool rooms in the South State Street, Chicago, but India and the possibility of Indians obtaining their freedom from England by any means has captured the imagination of the African American. Multiple Indian groups also formed out of solidarity with African American struggles, such as the Dalit Panthers, a group that fought caste oppression in India, and the South Asians for Black Lives movement. Indian American activists such as Ram Manohar Lohia rose to prominence for being jailed while protesting Jim Crow era laws. And, of course, the fantastic Bengali Renaissance was also formed around this time. A young poet from the Bengali and Harlem Renaissance ended up writing a poem titled how about it? Which read, Show me that you mean, democracy please, cause from Bombay to Georgia I'm beat to my knees. You can't lock up Nehru, club Roland Hayes, then make fine speeches about freedom's way. 
These are the words of poet Langston Hughes, who was also best known as the leader of the Harlem Renaissance. More recently, Southeast Asians have exemplified solidarity with the African American community as well, working to combat discrimination in educational systems, police violence, and poverty. Similarly, there has been a recorded history of African American resistance against the wars in Southeast Asia. Also, there is the story of Cao Tran, a Vietnamese American killed in 2003 after holding a vegetable peeler which police thought was a cleaver. And there's also Fong Lee, a Hmong American who was shot to death in 2006 by police who believed he was carrying a gun. Things like this bring us together, now more than ever. However, it hasn't all been solidarity and good vibes between Blacks and Asians in the U.S. In more modern history, we've seen the model minority myth open up a space for a wedge between the two groups, and interracial discrimination has ranged from Asian anti-Blackness regarding affirmative action and crime, to anti-Asian sentiments in the Black community on immigration, terrorism, and more recently, coronavirus. I think possibly the most telling way to look at this issue is through arguably the most infamous example of Black and Asian tensions in the United States, the 1992 Los Angeles riots. 28 years ago, the feeding of an African-American man, Rodney King, sparked what a 2020 article in The Independent referred to as the first multi-ethnic riots in the United States. And here's why. Following the Korean-American War, there was a huge influx of Korean immigrants to places such as LA. Additionally, with immigration restrictions loosening for Asian immigrants at the time, many Asians moved to cities on the East and the West Coast. Unable to qualify for housing or afford rent in spaces in white neighborhoods, they moved into historically black, underserved communities and opened up convenience stores. Many of them struggled with income, language barriers, and much like the African American community, lacked government aid. And like most immigrants from Asia, this was what they thought was the right path to the American dream. However, they were warned early on to be wary of one particular group, African Americans. Fast forward to the quiet morning of March 16, 1991. A 15-year-old girl from Illinois named Latasha Harlins entered a convenience store on the corner of 91st Street and Figaro Avenue in LA. A woman named Soon Jadu, a Korean immigrant and a store owner, noticed a bottle of orange juice sticking out of Harlins' backpack. Assuming she was stealing it, the two exchanged brief remarks before Du grabbed a handgun and shot Harlan. She died instantly. This was less than two weeks after video broadcasting of the beating of Rodney King, and with it boiled over the culmination of long-standing racial tensions in LA between Asians and African Americans. The sudden and large influx of Asians into black communities, as well as language barriers, led to discrimination from the black community towards the Asian community, and stereotyping, the assumption of criminal behavior, and demonization of the black community by Asians led to discrimination from Asians towards the black community as well. In the following riots, according to the article from The Independent, of an estimated $1 billion of damage perpetuated, 40% was inflicted on Korean Americans, who armed themselves and formed self-help groups as the police failed for days to stop the killing and looting. And tragically, the community never truly recovered. Police brutality is still an issue. Asian and Black communities face high interracial tensions, and we are all seeing these tensions play out even today. But what the riots did do, in fact, was put these issues on the map. And now, we have to learn from them. All races in America, including white Americans, have experienced police brutality in some manner, according to the statistics from MappingPoliceViolence.org. And it's an issue that should hit home for the Asian community, too. The 1997 killing of Quan Ching Hao, an intoxicated Chinese American, was a result of police who feared his quote-unquote martial arts skills and decided that that was a reason to take his life. And 
even an event as recent as 2016 was the horrific assault of Suresh Bhai Patel, a Gujarati immigrant like my own family, who was walking peacefully in his Alabama neighborhood when a man deemed him suspicious and called the police. Patel didn't speak any English, and the encounter with police led to an assault that left him paralyzed. Any charges pressed against the officers involved were, you guessed it, acquitted. This isn't just a reality for black people in the U.S. It's a reality for all of us. And in many moments post 9-11, brown South Asians have been weaponized in the eyes of the American public. That's why Asians need to care. Because if having empathy for the struggle of others for whatever reason isn't enough, you need to realize that we're only safe until we're not. In a 2014 article in Time magazine by Jack Lynchy titled Why Ferguson Should Matter to Asian Americans, the author calls for an increased solidarity between the groups, especially in the face of riots and racial injustice. It opens describing a vine that went viral after the Ferguson riots, which depicted a South Asian convenience store owner standing quietly in the middle of his destroyed store. Are you okay, sir? Yes, sir. It's just a mess. It's hard. It's hard to unlearn and relearn when you've been socialized to demonize the other side. It's hard when you're seeing your own race, your own brothers and sisters, your own community disproportionately killed at the hands of an institution that should exist to protect you. And it's hard when you see this unrest in society and your life's work, which you use to barely make ends meet, destroyed in front of your eyes. At some point, we see so much injustice and the tension between the two groups that it's hard to step up and say, I see you, I see your struggle, and I'm with you. But there are always people doing it, just as they did many years ago, and that gives me hope. For those of you who drive, you might be familiar with this analogy of putting on glasses. <laughs> Let me explain. So, before you start driving, whether you're a kid or an adult, often we sort of just sit in the car and stare out the window, mostly oblivious to the actual action of driving or the rules of the road. But let me tell you, once you sit behind the steering wheel and learn to pay attention to every action of ourselves and of others, you really can't ever sit in a car the same way again. You have this new lens, a type of glasses that you can't take off, with which you see the world. And I find it's similar with social injustice. But in order to see it, you need to first try to learn. And then you must open your heart and your head to empathy for others. Grace Lee Boggs once said that when ideas become fixed, they die. I can't pretend to have all the information or the guidance on how we can overcome these issues. In fact, I've barely scratched the surface. But even now, I am still learning, trying to convey as much as I can in the best way I can. But what I can promise you is change. Because it's already happening. I see the world moving towards being more conscious. I see it when diverse people stand for a common cause. So. Be open to change, be open to empathy, and be open to learn, unlearn, and relearn. Don't let your ideas become fixed. Instead, work to fix improper ideas with the help of the people around you. And that's it for this week's episode. If you have any questions, you want to drop me a comment, head over to my Facebook page called Model Minority Uniquely American. Also, if you like what you hear and want to support, check out my Patreon, which is linked on my website and my Facebook page. Model Minority was created, written, and produced by yours truly, Nevi Shastri. All of our music comes from Purple Planet and the CC Creative Commons. And if you lasted this long through this episode with me, shukriya, thank you for listening. And as always, I'm so glad to have you here. <laughs>